Hi everybody, I'm Zilla Blitz and welcome. Today we're gonna to begin a playthrough with Sicily 43 from Assault Games. Now this is the latest and newest version in their World War II tactical combat system. This edition takes us to the Western Front, specifically the Jella Beachhead in Sicily in 1943. We've got US forces versus German and Italian forces. In this episode, we're gonna kind of give a systems and a game overview and set up our scenario. Let's get started. One quick announcement as we get an overview of our battlefield here. If you're watching this on October of 2023, the crowdfunding has started on GameFound. I'll put a link to that in the description. You can check that out if you might be interested in backing the game. So our scenario is all set up and ready to go. We've got our US forces on the right side, German forces on the left side. There are three objectives. The Germans control one right here, which is a building. US control another, which is a building here. And this two-story building right here is the contested objective. Victory will largely depend on which side controls this farmhouse with the walls here, building some of the rocky output at the end of the scenario. But we'll dig more into that a little bit later. First up, what I want to do in this scenario zero if you would, is to give an overview of the different game systems. This is a system that plays very uniquely, a tactical World War II combat system with a lot of little things to talk about, and I think our enjoyment of a playthrough will be enhanced if we spend just a little time in a short video here, kind of walking through some of the mechanics and talking about some of the components and game systems. So, with that in mind, let's get started. Now, as we do start out, there's two caveats I want to mention. Caveat number one, this is a prototype, so some of the things might change, and I know some of the things have changed, like some of the design on the unit cards, there's been a few minor rule changes and things like that. So some things might change between this and the final version, take that into consideration. The second thing is, this is the fourth game that I've played with this system. I still consider myself very much a student and learning the system. So I wouldn't take this as a strict and fast tutorial, especially considering, again, that this is a prototype, and some things and even some minor rule changes might happen between now and the final version and to be fair mistakes will be made i still i'm hopeful that this will give you a general sense of what gameplay is like i hope to keep mistakes to a minimum of course but consider this more an exposition of gameplay rather than a tutorial as we dig in, I want to talk a little bit about scale because these are all geomorphic, geomorphic boards. They're printed on both sides and there are a pile of them that come with the game. So uh, we've got beach ones here for the Jello Beachhead scenarios. A key component, I think, of this game is its depth. There is a massive campaign game that has legacy elements. So your troops are carrying over from one battle to the next and it's a forking campaign. So how you do in one battle dictates what the starting position and the kind of the composition of the next battle. There are are scenarios, there are formation cards, units, tons of maps. It, this is a sandbox in addition to the scenarios and the campaign that comes with it. So the scale of what you can do with this game is really big. It's really important, I think, to realize that this is a system with incredible depth to it. The other scale that I want to talk about is the unit scale, kind of the hex scale and stuff like that with movement and distance and ranges and things like that. Those have been intentionally morphed and played with, if you would, to create a game system that enhances and emphasizes the tactical decisions and tactical combat. One of the things you realize is that it, this is a very gritty tactical game, but how wide each hex is, is isn't really stated. Stacking is one unit per hex, but you think about it, if these were squads in reality, yeah, you could probably get two, three, maybe even four squads in a hex, but a lot of the decisions behind the design of this game has been to emphasize the tactical playability of the game instead of some adherence to a set of kind of rules that more reflect the accurate distances and ranges that would be present in tactical combat. So you want to be aware of that before you jump into the game. Now I mentioned early on that we've got US forces over here and German forces over here. With this I want to kind of talk a little bit about the scenario balance and one of the key design mechanics of this game that I think really gives it a lot of both uh, variety, depth, and replayability, and that's the idea of unit formations. So what we've got is a balanced yet asymmetrical force in this scenario. Basically what's made up is here, we've got a formation of in two infantry formations, one for each side, and two armor formations, one for each side. Now what's a formation? Let's take a look. 
Here is our deck of formation cards, and there are three types for each side. We've got artillery kind of gun formations, armor formations, and then infantry formations. And so for this scenario here, we've got one German infantry formation and one German armored formation. Now, there's a bunch of ways that you could set these up, right? You could just randomly pick one out of the deck, or you could have each player let play each player kind of choose which formation that they want. For this one, I kind of semi-chose them for each side to kind of highlight a couple of different things. And although, and the idea generally behind this, if we look at these cards, so for the German side, we have their armor formation that I chose, and there's like maybe 15, 20 of these you can pick from in the game, uh, is a Tiger E tank, because I thought a Tiger would be fun to have, and then a Panzer J tank. Two tanks, and they are at this veteran level here, which gives them a good experience level to start with, because all units in the game have different levels of experience. And if you play the campaign game, they gain experience as they go through and uh, kind of fight through different battles and things. The infantry platoon that I took for the Germans is emphasizing the tank destroying capabilities of this. We've got a sniper, two tank hunter uh, kind of uh, teams, and then four rifle squads. I kind of wish I had picked maybe a mortar here and a machine gun, but we're just gonna run with it and see how it plays out. And that's kind of the beauty. You could do this battle, one infantry formation, one armor formation, pick completely different formations. So we could go with an infantry formation like this, which is a motorized rifle platoon, two rifles, a mortar, a 75 millimeter infantry gun, and then three trucks. That's a completely different starting force than the one we've got right here. Likewise, we could take a different armored one and we could have an assault tank section, which is two uh, Stug H42s. So you can get the basic idea that the formation cards kind of create a tremendous amount of variety and options for replayability with scenarios, as well as some interesting choices if you'd like to set them up that way. Here's the two US formations that I chose for this battle. We've got an experienced, so a hardened ranger platoon, four ranger platoons, a bazooka team, a sniper, a mortar, and a light machine gun, medium machine gun. And then for the armor, I chose, we get two Stuarts and a Sherman, but notice that they're at the recruit level, which means that they are at some ex serious experiential di uh, kind of disadvantages. This may be like their first time in combat. These are green troops that are going to crack under pressure and the system kind of brings that in to play. So these are the two forces that we've got up and I wanted to show you kind of how this formation card works because I think that's a big element of the replayability in the game. Let's talk about units and unit cards because this is well and kind of gives a, a very unique design experience to when you're playing this game. If we look at the units here they have two sides a full strength side and then a half strength side. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, hits on units too, because it's not just a two-step system, it's actually a four-step system. So they're flipped over for half strength. This we can see the experience counters are put under them, so we can see our rangers are hardened, they have some combat experience, and should perform overall pretty well. But you'll notice that there's no information on the counter. I mean, we've got the nationality and the type, but that's it. The information for the counters, and like we can see the same thing for the 57 uh, millimeter anti-tank gun, the information for the counter sits on the ranger's card. And you put these off to the side of the board so that when the ranger does something and you need information for it, it's all right here on the card. We've got the movement factors up here. We've got the point value of the car, of the unit right here. We've got its defensive dice, which we'll talk about um, as we get to that very shortly. Then we've got its firing capacity down here at different ranges. So it really can't fire at tanks. At a, a one to three shot here, it's got the it's using these attack dice, and it's uh, four to six is this, seven to nine is this, and it's the ranges. Close combat is in here for this element as well. So we can see that all of these units have all of their information off to the side, which actually creates an interesting gameplay because with the one stacking and the hexes here, you can toss these uh, markers down to dictate what the action of the unit was. It creates for a very uncluttered tactical combat experience, which I really appreciate. So here we have the anti-tank guns values here, and then likewise we have, if we want to take a look at our Sherman's values here, they're all here. Very nuanced, very unique, and all to the unit. Likewise, on the back side of it, so for example, if we look at our rangers here, because this is actually going to be an interesting component of their setup, we have the unique characteristics of the unit. So the rangers have a scout characteristic and they have a recon pr patrol characteristic. And we're gonna talk about those because we're gonna change the US setup based on that just a little bit in a moment. But these give us features of it. So if a unit has some special characteristics, like it's slow, it's got a tall silhouette or something like that, those rules are all articulated on the back of the card, which you can kind of flip over to get. Now, one of the things that you'll notice that's not here 
are leaders. This is a, there are no leader counters on the board and there aren't counters for leaders in the game. So the question is, how is command and control executed in the game? The game has three gameplay levels. In the base game, everything moves every turn. That's a very simple way to do it. Then there's, uh, uh, there's additional advanced rules or optional rules, if you want to call them, that add in a command and control element, but the, uh, the role of the leadership is abstracted at that level. And basically what you get is you get a certain amount of command tokens per side, as well as command cards that you can use to execute various special functions and kind of special elements on your side. So these are kind of very unpredictable. They can add a lot of different things and add a lot of different gameplay elements into the game. For the scenario that we're going to play today, I'm not going to use the command cards. I think for each scenario, you start out with three and you pull up at the end of each hand and thing like that. But we are going to use the command points. So we'll take a look at how those work in terms of gameplay. So we're gonna be kind of halfway between the full gameplay and the core game. The reason I don't want to use the cards is because I feel they take a long time to execute in a video format. They don't really make the game very, they don't make the game more complex. I think you should play with them, but I think in a video format, they just take a long time kind of explain and they slow things down a little bit more than I would like to for this video. One of the other things I want to show that's connected to this idea of leadership and morale and, and those kind of human elements of combat is the troop management board and how the game handles that. So we're looking here at basically five columns. This is on the right hand side, we've got our turn record track here. Our scenario that we're playing now goes up to nine turns and we are on turn one, not turn two. Then we have a middle column here that represents pressure. I'll talk about that momentarily. And then two outside tracks that represent losses, one for the Allied forces and one for the German forces. Now, the pressure track here, uh, these are the indicators of current level of pressure. It's at two. As units, as sides take losses, their losses are tracked on this loss board and then once it goes past 12, it comes back down to zero, but the pressure goes up one. And then you'll notice that as the pressure goes up three levels for the US, we hit this little marker field called withdraw, which means the US forces have to start to withdraw from the battlefield, then there's routed, and then there is surrender. So as you sustain losses, your morale and your willingness to fight starts to crack. Now this can also decrease depending upon if you can achieve some of your objectives. So if you can get it down to zero, then all of a sudden you won the scenario. So it's not necessarily a fatalistic approach that this is going to go up. There are elements in the game that can make it go down. To give an example of how this might work, here's the U.S. sniper. The value of the U.S. sniper right here in the top right corner is four. If the U.S. sniper team were to get killed, go to half strength, it goes to two and then goes to zero, that would be a four point loss that would go up to four. Sherman tank is 16 big points. It's only two tank, three tanks for the US in this formation. So yeah, losing one of the Shermans would be big. That would send it all the way through the roof, back to four on this level from zero to 12 plus four is 16, and then increases the pressure level at one. So yeah, you wanna protect that, that unit for sure. But this is basically how kind of the, the willingness to fight and morale and those elements are handled within the combat system. Let's talk for a moment now on the flow of gameplay. At the beginning of each turn, sometimes the scenario dictates who has initiative, but for most game turns, you're gonna be rolling two dice. The higher number gets the initiative, and there's a pre kind of action phase that you go through that involves some indirect fire and some other elements there, changing of facing of artillery, of guns and stuff like that. Uh, and then you dig into the heart of the game, which is the action phase. And so basically each side is going to execute a command for one of their units, and you're going to go back and forth back and forth. The turn ends when all the commands are exhausted or there are three consecutive passes, whichever happens first. So the game flow goes, it's, you're not waiting for a long time for your opponent to move. You're kind of acting with the unit, then your opponent goes. There is reaction fire as one would expect in a tactical game like this. So there's a constant kind of ebb and flow of doing stuff. You never feel like you're waiting for a while for your, turn, your opponent to move. Now let's talk a little bit about how commands work in kind of this optional level because it's a big part of the game in terms of you can't move everybody at the optional level. You have to kind of exert your command and your control over those troops that you think are the most critical to that particular turn's uh, movement in combat. So let's take a little bit of a look at how that works with the U.S. forces. So right now we're looking at the two U.S. formation cards and we'll notice in the bottom left corner of the formation cards there are these red command token indicators. For the tank uh, formation, we get two. 
uh, commands, and for the uh, infantry formation, we get one, two, three, four, five, six commands. So I've pulled out six command tokens and two command tokens, which means the US force has eight commands that it can execute every turn. Now, if you add up the number of units that we've got out on the, on the battlefield, we've got 12 units. So roughly two thirds of our units are going to be, now there are some free actions, but roughly two thirds of our units are gonna be able to do something in any given turn. And so what we have to do at the beginning of the turn in that pre-activity phase is allocate these tokens to the units that we want to act in that turn. But it's not entirely predetermined because you take three of the tokens and you put them off to the side and you can put those on any units you want to as the turn plays out. So we're gonna hold three tokens off to the side. Then we have to take the remaining five here and put them on units that we think we want to act in that given turn. So now I know, for example, we want the Sherman to move. So we're gonna put one up here on the Sherman. We're gonna want probably both Stuarts to move. So I'm gonna put one on the Stuart, but I've got three off to the side so I can use one for the other Stuart if I want to. Definitely want to have our anti-tank gun push up. I definitely want to have our machine gun. So I'm dropping one off on the side for that one too to move up. And I definitely know we're gonna get one of our Ranger platoons moving. So I've allocated our five kind of command tokens that we have to allocate and we keep these three in the bank to get some flexibility to kind of be more responsive and adaptable as the turn plays out. So that's how the command and control system works and each time you execute an order for a unit you flip that command token up meaning that you've exhausted it. Once you've exhausted all your command tokens in a turn you're done. The last thing I want to do is to show you the combat system because this I think is one of the most unique things in the game and one of the benefits from this is it removes almost all of the math and odds calculations that are required to execute the game. It makes the execution of the combat a very unique experience and it kind of gets you more into kind of a gritty nature of combat rather than doing a lot of math calculations. But let's talk about how it works. Right in the middle here, we've got our combat dice. And combat dice have four different levels. Red is the most deadly. Here we can see two hits on this one. A lot of hits and very few misses. Yellow is your second most deadly. Green is your third most deadly. And the blues are kind of the wimpy ones. Not too many hits on the blue dice. We've got a bunch of these here. And basically how combat works is you calculate the number of the dice that are going to be used for the attacker you can, and the colors of the dice. You calculate the number of dice and colors that are going to be used for the defender then you roll them for both sides you match them up and there's this knocking out system that occurs and then whatever's left is damage that's inflicted on the unit so let's just walk through a very very simple hypothetical combat example to show how this dice system works Let's say our Rangers squad is firing at the German rifle squad at a range of five hexes. So the first thing we wanna do is we're gonna calculate the number of attack dice that the Ranger squad is gonna get. Here is the four to six range firing against infantry or an anti-tank gun. It gets a red and a blue attack die. So it's gonna get one of the very best attack dice and one of the weakest attack dice. So we'll give those to the Ranger squad here. For the Germans, we can see their defense dice are around the unit. Infantry units don't have facing. Uh, Anti-tank guns and armor does, vehicles do, which is really important, but we see they just get a yellow defensive die as their basic generic die. Now there's a lot of other calculations that go into this. This is by far the most complicated part of the whole game and learning experience, but you can have different things. Like for example, the Germans might get a green die if they occupy a certain part, kind of terrain. If there's obstructing in terrain in the way like smoke or perhaps some rocks or something like that, they might get an additional die. If the unit has enough experience, they might get an additional attack die. Um, if the unit did a fast movement, they might lose one of their attack dice. So you're working through this kind of process to determine the final attack dice that are involved in each attack. But let's say for the sake of simplicity, we get something like, I don't know, something like this, a red, a yellow, let's throw a green one in here for the Germans, they're in a pretty good defensive situation. So we get something like this, and the, the US forces, the Rangers are gonna roll the red and the blue die, the Germans are gonna roll the yellow, the blue, and the green to defend. Let's see what results they get. Let's step back for one quick second though and just talk about what kind of results we can get. We can get four different kinds of results. This skull and crossbones represents a critical hit. The next level of success for an attacking roll is this uh, hit, which is basically this bullseye marker here. An X means a suppression and a blank face means nothing, no result. So those are one of the four different results we're gonna get. Now let's just do some hypothetical rolls for both the Rangers and the Germans. 
So the Rangers rolled really well. We got a critical hit, a hit, and a hit. So everything worked with their dice. For the, the rifle squad, they did pretty well too. They got a critical hit, a hit, and a suppression. And so now we have to figure out what the heck happened, right? And the way you do it is you just match the dice up at their same strength levels. So we can take the critical hit from the Ranger force and the critical hit for the rifle and the defense here. So again, the Rangers firing at the rifle squad. Only the rifles can, can get damaged. The Rangers can't get damaged while firing. This is a tactical game. So those two are gonna cross each other out. Now this blank one here doesn't do anything for the Germans, so that doesn't help at all. But then we have these other two levels here, which is uh, this one blocks a suppression. The rifle would have successfully blocked a, su a suppression roll, but this is a hit roll, which is stronger than a suppression roll. So this can't block it. So at the end of the battle here, what happened is, the ranger squad got one hit on the rifle that got through is that one hit on the rifle squad and let's go see how damage works in the game as well we would now have our rifle squad counter up here you might think okay they got a hit you flip it over but not so fast you'll notice that there's two hearts on the other side of this one most infantry squads are four strength point units you can see this basically on their card up here we have the four hearts for at full strength on that top left there so a four hit unit can take four hits before you wipe it out, two before you flip it over. That's where these little red tokens come in. We would drop the red token on the rifle squad to let it know that it's got one hit. Now, one hit to a full strength squad doesn't impair its functionality or anything like that. You start to lose, uh, you start to lose, product you start to lose productivity and strength when you're down to half strength. But that's a rough overview of how combat works, and this is the system. We'll dig into this a lot more in our, our playthrough, but just to kind of give you a, an idea for how it works, I want to do a very simple example here. Now, there's a lot of things we have haven't covered things like movement, smoke, anti-tank guns, immobilization, uh, suppression, all these kinds of things, but we'll dig into those as we get into the playthrough, I'm sure as they happen organically in the course of play. And the only other thing I would mention too is we're leaving out in this playthrough two things. One, as I mentioned, is we're leaving out the command cards to kind of keep things moving in a video format. The second thing is, um, if you're familiar with Red Horizon 41, the first module in this uh, game system, that had an expansion, which was artillery and air support. That expansion is included in the core game of Sicily 43, and I'm not going to use that here because it's not super complex. I just want to kind of show the core gameplay and the essence of what's happening while keeping it down to kind of a, a structured core, if you would. So those are the two big things that we won't see and see through in this playthrough. Everything else we will see and enjoy. Now, if we do look at the scenario again right here to kind of wrap up and to give a teaser for where we're heading, we have the objective to be the Germans and the US forces trying to get to this building here and get control of this building behind the Jella beachhead. The Germans are over here in some vineyards. The US forces are over here in an olive grove. Um, we have our machine gun here, anti-tank gun here for the US, our mortar team here, which has the smoke capability, which might come in handy for us. US armor is back here. Our goal is for the US forces, we wanna have the Rangers try to get onto this armor. We wanna load them up, try to get them up here as fast as we can, try to take and hold this one before the German forces can get there. They have a longer distance to go and their troops are farther apart. So I think we can take advantage of the troop carrying capacity to transport troops up. It's risky because when units are on riding on tanks, they can get blown apart pretty easily. But we're gonna kind of put the hammer down as the US forces, we're Rangers. So we're gonna kind of be bold there. For the Germans, I think we have to be a little bit, we, we need to use this armor very well. Our experienced Tiger tanks, our veteran Tiger tanks, hopefully can put a hurt on this US armor, which is recruit level. They should wilt under fire relatively quickly. So if we can get up and start to put some heavy fire on the US forces here, we've got a good well-positioned anti-tank gun over here on the, the lower end of the scale here, and then move up. We've got some pretty good terrain here. We've got some craters here to work with. We've got some cover here with some brush and stuff like that, some rocks. We can potentially move up here, a nice trench, trench system here to let down suppressive fire. Uh, we've got some pretty good opportunities to move up through terrain to get up here as well. Whereas the US are going to have to cover open ground with those tanks to get there. So we'll see how it all plays out. We'll be back in episode one. I'll put a link to it as soon as it's ready. Let me know if you have any questions or if there's anything you'd like to hear more about. Thanks for watching everybody. I'll see you in the next video.